chapter nine is on diet and dental care. So here what we're going to do is we're going to look at what the relationship is between food and caries, food and cavities. So let's start with this statement over here. Now, preventing cavities is not as simple as saying don't eat sugar. We always tell our kids, you know, don't eat sugar, you'll get cavities. First of all, that's not necessarily true because um, if they brush right after and if they do, you know, their good oral hygiene care, um, it, it might work to their favor and they won't get cavities. So um, don't eat sugar. It's a common statement. Everyone associates sugar with cavities, which I can see why, because sugar does cause um, cavities, uh, especially if we're not good with their oral hygiene. But more importantly, here's something people don't realize. It's not only sugar. It's also carbohydrates. It's also food that are um, sticky, that, you know, stick to your teeth. So, for example, bread, crackers, uh, goldfish, that's what my kids eat for snack, stuff like that, that kind of stick to your teeth like chocolate chip cookies that's actually doing very um a lot of damage to your mouth and it can cause cavities which we will look at so how does cavities happen the word demineralization is important because demineralized basically means that the, the tooth is getting weak enamels are coming kind of cut the enamel is getting weak and um, it has now has an opportunity for a cavity to occur so when you eat there's bacteria, there's plaque in our mouth, right? So that when, what you eat, plus the bacteria in our mouth, it creates an acid. And that acid goes on, when the acid goes on the tooth, it can weaken the enamel. And now um, what can happen is you can get decay. Okay, so what's nice to know is that teeth can be mineralized, teeth can get hard. So one of the things we're gonna look at is we can apply fluoride. And when we apply fluoride, which we do professionally, and even at home we can use a fluoride toothpaste, it will harden, or it will remineralize, that's what we say. It'll remineralize, all the minerals will come back, uh, the tooth. So in our saliva, we have calcium, we have phosphorus, and those are great elements that replace the lost minerals. So sometimes when we're eating, we're going to have like an acid attack in our mouth where um, there's lots of acid. And so what we want to do is we want to have lots of fluoride, so fluoride kind of hardens the tooth, we also want the saliva that um, to kind of wash over this area because saliva has calcium and phosphorus and that also makes the teeth hard and less resistant to cavity. So let's talk about demineralization. So we have, this is a pH scale and in the pH scale, normally our mouth is around like seven, 6.8 to 7.0. Okay, that's like the, the, the normal oral pH or the normal pH in our mouth. What happens is when it drops to 5.5, okay, so when it drops over here, 5.5, this is when we're worried because now demineralization can happen. Now um, the teeth or enamel can get weak and um, it, it, it's kind of getting acidic because this is, if you go this way, it gets acidic. If you go this way, it gets basic. So there are some food that you can see here that becomes, uh, if you eat, the pH in the mouth goes more acidic. The pH goes lower, which means it becomes more acidic. So we don't like it when the pH goes to 5.5. That's our critical pH because when it does go to 5.5, the teeth can demineralize or get weak. The minerals kind of come out from the enamel. Okay, so again, 5.5, that is our critical pH level. We get worried when it, it's 5.5 and lower because now the enamel gets weak, as you see here. This just shows you what happens first, second, third, all the way to sixth. So here we have a perfectly healthy tooth, no cavities. Here we get demineralization. So the white spots are demineralization. And actually, I should show you that here. When you see white spots on the teeth, it, there could be lots of reasons like fluorosis and whatnot, um, like hypocalcification. But demineralization kind of looks like white spots like that. That's what it looks like. Um, I've seen people who have braces and they don't do a good job with their oral hygiene. And once the braces come off, you see a lot of white spots. And that's demineralization happening where the enamel got weak and lost its minerals. So you get a white spot here. So this person is at risk for cavities because now we see that demineralization. We see that white spot and it's starting to break down. The enamel is going, coming out from it. And now we get... Um, like this is a lesion and then what happens is it becomes um, deeper and deeper and soon that if we don't get it fixed it can become fractured like this right so we never we want to address it right away as if we 
can just apply fluoride and do good diligent with our oral hygiene, be diligent with our oral hygiene, it'll stay like this. Once we see demineralization, once we see white spots, we're going to get worried. So I'm going to apply a lot of fluoride for this client. I'm going to educate the client on good oral hygiene. If it gets to this, this stage over here, I'm going to tell the client, okay, we need to get this fixed. We need to get this restored. You know, and here and here, like you can see, it's very severe and they now need more expensive dental work. So it's better to kind of nip it in the butt earlier so that it doesn't cost them more uh, to replace it or to fill it rather to restore it at a later date so always catch it early always give them intervention prevention strategies earlier so that it doesn't proceed to that state and that's what we're going to look at today we're going to look at what we can do with clients that are at risk for cavities okay so demineralization has a white spot it's basically what happens is the um the tooth structure kind of gets weak and then the calcium, so we have calcium inside our enamel, inside our tooth, and that kind of leaks out. And it leaches out from the tooth structure, which means it then demineralizes. It makes it weak and you can get a white spot. So you may notice from like semester one when you were taking, um, when you were learning about the tooth and you learned about the elements within the tooth. So there's hydroxyapatite that is that can uh, come out when it gets demineralized and then what's nice is saliva actually has fluoride in it and so we're hoping that the saliva there's enough saliva in the client in this client's mouth so that when the fluoride goes back in um, it strengthens the tooth so demineralization is when it's 5.5 or lower and hydroxyapatite comes out of the of the tooth or of the enamel once it reaches that 5.5 critical ph what we want is we want remineralization. We want the pH to get higher. We want the, the enamel to get hardened. We want the minerals to come back. And so when the pH becomes a 7.0, which is the neutral uh, pH, which is the pH we want in our mouth, then what happens is the minerals do come back. So the lost minerals, the calcium and phosphorus, the fluoride, they uh, come back and remineralize the tooth. So here we have an acid attack, which was making the enamel really weak. Thankfully, we have saliva in our mouth. So this is applicable for people that have lots of adequate sal salivary flow. For people that have xerostomia, they're at further risk for um, cavities because they don't have saliva that washes away the acid, that washes away the food particles, that brings the minerals back into the tooth structure to make it hard. So we like it when we have saliva because saliva brings the minerals back and it rebuilds the tooth enamel. Okay, this is like really bad cavities that we're seeing over here, right? So when demineralization, um, when there's more demineralization happening in our mouth, so when the enamel is getting weaker and weaker, cavities can develop. Well, but when there's more remineralization, so when the enamel is getting stronger and stronger by the minerals like calcium and phosphate, then um, our mouth is uh, remains caries free. So we want more remineralization happening in our mouth. We don't want to see lots of demineralization happening. And in our mouth, there's continuous demineralization, remineralization um, happening, and we want more remineralization so that we don't get cavities. Now, some might think, okay, so if I have a high sugar intake or a high carbs intake and my food is always, you know, stuck to my teeth and I'm not doing a good job with my oral hygiene, will I get cavities right away? No, not necessarily. It takes 19 to 22 months for a uh, cavitation to occur, for cavities to occur. And this is for someone who has high risk of cavities. If they eat a lot of carbs, like bread, um, cookies, uh, pasta, for example, that really stick to your teeth and kind of goes in between, you know, the, in between the teeth, you're at high risk for cavities. And you're not, if you're not removing it, um, cavities could happen. But remember, it takes a while. It takes, it doesn't happen immediately. It can take anywhere from 19 to 22 months. Now, someone who is at low risk, so the first one was if someone who is at a high risk, they can get cavities, you know, as soon as 19 to 22 months. But someone who is at low risk, it can take up to five years. Okay, so that's, we always want someone to be at low risk so that it takes them, if the cavities were to happen, it would take a very long time. Five years. So when we're looking at cavities, 
what plays a role? Like, how does cavities actually happen? Well, there's like so many different factors that take um, a role. So carbs, which we're going to look at. If you have a high carb intake, there's a, a chance that you could get a high chance that you can get cavities. There are specific bacteria in your mouth that are related, that are linked to cavities, which we'll look at. Susceptible tooth structure. So if you have braces, if you have like lots of rotated teeth, it's harder to clean, right? And so when it's harder to clean, it's going to it's going to increase your chance of getting cavities. Fluoride is so, so important to reduce the risk of cavities. So if, they're not, if the client is not using a fluoride toothpaste, the client is not coming for a cleaning and getting fluoride application uh, regularly, they're going to be at risk. If they don't have enough saliva, so there's serostomia, dry mouth, they're going to be at risk because we know saliva is so important in washing up all the uh, food and all the acid attacks. And then Poor oral hygiene habits. So if they're not brushing or flossing, you bet they're going to be at risk for cavities. So let's look at our first point. So food and caries. So carbohydrates and dental caries are heavily linked. There was actually a very um, unethical study that was held. It's called the Vibe Home Study. Some people call it the Vipe Home Study. I'm going to call it the Vibe Home Study. And what happened in this study, okay, was they went to um, a mental institution. So all of these um, individuals here are living in a mental institution, and they did a study on these individuals. And, and and these are the individuals that they can't even advocate for themselves. So, I mean, I can go on a whole tan another tangent about how unethical this study was. Um, but what they did was this study was done between 1945 to 1953, and they used 436 adults to do this. And what they were testing on was uh, they were testing to see if, you know, if they eat sugar, does it cause cavities? So that what they did was they gave, they divided the all these people, so it's 436 people, they divided them into three groups, so one group, two group, three groups, and they gave the first group uh, food with 300 grams of additional sugar. So they gave more sugar to the first group. The second group, they gave them 50 grams of sugar plus bread. Bread is carbs. And then the third group, they gave them like um, lots of snacks in between their meals. And the snacks, were hard, like were tofu and candy. And it just breaks my heart to, uh, like, just by looking at this, you're giving them more sugar. You're giving them sugar with bread, with carbs. You're giving them like hard candy that's going to stick to your teeth. And these are people that live in the mental institution. They don't even have a voice. They can't even, sometimes they can't even tell you that their teeth are hurting. And then you're, you're doing this to these individuals. Like how ethical is that, right? So unethical. Anyways, when they did that study, they found out that the people that had the in-between meal candy, so the people that had, that were taking, um, so they had meals and then they had a snack, um, and then they had another meal and then they had another bad snack and another meal and another bad snack. These individuals had the highest cavity rate. And then the second one was the one that had, um, when they were given bread and they were given a sweet spread like jelly or jam on the bread, they also were at risk for cavity. So they were the second highest. What does this tell us? This tells us that the frequency matters. So if you, you know, eat continuously throughout the day, with you, know, you snack a lot throughout the days with sugar or with um, even like, you know, on a bread and you put like jam in it, which is full of sugar, that is going to definitely increase the chance of you getting cavities. So the more you eat unhealthy, the more, well, I should say, the more carbs or sugar you eat, the more likely you're going to get cavities. And the form of the food also matters. So retentive foods like carbs, like bread, pasta, cookies, uh, cake, the ones that really stick to your teeth, they are going to stay in the mouth longer compared to liquids. So they're going to increase the chance of you getting cavities. And then, of course, sugar, right? Sugar can also definitely cause cavities. <clears throat> so let's talk about carbohydrates. So when we're looking at carbohydrates, um, carbohydrates have sugars in them. When they break down, they kind of have sugar. And these ultra uh, processed foods, so these foods that kind of go through a factory and, and get made like um, cereal, crackers, um, goldfish, and others, and chips and stuff like that, they, um, 
are more likely, if you eat these, this is more likely to get cavities compared to unprocessed foods. Not to say unprocessed food doesn't cause cavity, but um, these processed foods do cause cavity because these, uh, when we have bacteria in your mouth, the bacteria loves these carbs and they'll like mush together and they'll make acid and this acid demineralizes or this acid weakens the enamel. So bacteria plus this food, sugar, because carbs make sugar. So bacteria plus sugar cause an acid attack and that acid attack will weaken the enamel. So let's talk about frequency again. Every time you sip and graze, so let's say let's say like pop for example um i have a bottle of pop and every 30 seconds i'm taking a sip that is so detrimental to my teeth um, and to my health because every time i'm sipping what's happening is pop is very acidic okay so every time i'm sipping my mouth it starts neutral right because everyone's mouth is like between a 6.8 to 7. when i drink pop it goes all the way down to four so now my teeth aren't happy my teeth are getting demineralized and then after 30 seconds i i take another sip it keeps like going staying in this acidic environment and so that's not good because when it keeps staying in this acidic en um, environment the enamel is getting weak and weak and we want the enamel to kind of go here so frequency, if you're sipping continuously throughout the day, it's not good. If we're snacking like really bad food continuously throughout the day, like chocolate chip cookies every day, you know, every, I don't know, two, three hours, we're, keep, we're just making this uh, pH in our mouth acidic, which is never a good thing because it weakens the enamel. So let's look at an example of someone's uh, diet diary. And you can see here, this is a 24-hour diet diary. So in one day, this is what they ate. And when, what I want you guys to know is that when you look at this, so here, this client had coffee with sugar, okay, with cream and sugar, um, eggs, toast, orange juice. So orange juice has some sugar, coffee has some sugar, but when you take a sugary diet and you pair it with a protein or a fat, so in this case, protein is eggs, fat could be cheese, it kind of buffers out the acid it kind what it does is it cancels out that acid attack so when you're eating what we recommend is you pair your food with a protein like eggs or meat and with or uh, with uh, fat so cheese is a good example of fat because when you do that you buffer out the attack the acid and, and so then you don't have an acid attack happening let's look at so this is good if you look at this one snack this person had a snack, but they did not pair it with um, something. If they had paired it with cheese, if they had paired it with milk, which is um, a dairy, so a dairy product can also cancel out the attack, it, it would be good. So when a breakfast bar stays in your mouth, it actually takes up to 60 minutes for it to wash out. So let's look here. Anything solid, like a breakfast bar, it takes up to anywhere from 45 to 60, so 60 minutes for it to clear out from your mouth. If you look at this example, so they had lettuce, they had chicken, which is a protein, that's good. Walnuts, something hard is good because it stimulates salivary flow. Um, cranberries is sticky, right? Dried can cranberries could be sticky. Um, soda, soda is bad because it can be um, acidic. But what you're noticing here is that when you look at this meal, they had some good stuff with it. So even though soda is bad and it's acidic, um, and even though cranberries is bad because it's retentive, it sticks to your teeth, they paired it with a protein, with chicken. Um, and so that chicken and walnuts is something crunchy too. It kind of buffers out or cancels out the acid attack. And that's why you don't see a number here. So this one is not that concerning. If you look at this one, apple is good because um, it uh, is something hard. Something hard is good as long as it's not retentive because something hard and crunchy stimulates saliva flow so saliva can wash it out. But look at the soda. So this person had soda and soda is an acid um, attack and it takes 20 to 30 minutes. So we're just going to be conservative. Actually, we're going to be really going to use the higher number. So 30 minutes is how long it took for this uh, to wash away from this person's mouth. Okay, look at this one, chips. Okay, so chips is like something starchy, it's retentive, it sticks to your teeth. And they had it with a sports drink, and a sports drink is liquid. So chips is 60 minutes, sports is 30 minutes. So a sport drink is 30 minutes, so we're going to go with the higher numbers of 60. That means this is going to stay in their mouth for 60 minutes. What would have been better is if it had paired the chips with the protein, with the dairy, with the fat. And they didn't. They paired it with a sports drink. 
Here, we don't see a number at the bottom, which means that it probably canceled out. It pro the acid attack never happened. So let's look at this. Lasagna, lasagna noodles as a starch. It takes 60 minutes for it to clear out, but it was paired with cheese. So it cancels out, right? So if you have water, um, that's also good. So we also recommend that if you have bread and you, you know, have water or milk or cheese or something, it cancels out the attack. So that's why you see no number here chocolate chip cookies. Now this person didn't have it with milk, which would have been ideal because it would kind of cancel out, but this person had it um, alone. So it's a 60 minute attack as chocolate chip cookies stay in your mouth for up to 60 minutes. So you can see just by looking at this, um, I'm just trying to show you here, this graph over here, this is a pH scale. So this is 5.5, which is critical pH. There were so many dips, right? So many times where the pH level went really down. And so if you look at when they had chips and sports drink, which is around a four, and the chocolate chip cookies, it really dipped down because we were really concerned that when the pH goes down to like three, for example, it's acidic and, um, you know, your teeth can start dissolving, your teeth, the minerals can be lost. This, what we're looking at is a step in curve. Okay, so it kind of, it was made in 1943. And what they say is that the pH drops in three minutes. Um, so as soon as you eat something sugary, in three minutes, the pH will, will drop. And so here's an example. So you normally, the mouth is at 6.8 to 7. Now I ate a sugar type of, uh, you know, let's say I had chocolate chip cookies, or let's say I had candies. My pH went all the way down to like almost three and then it takes a while it can take up to 30 minutes for it to get back to a seven okay so it, it is something to, to watch for so we have to think about what we're eating and is it really dipping down all the time like a lot and if it is that's not good right we really we want the ph to be as neutral as possible so if we're eating something it should shot, shoot back up right away um so that or we can pair it with something like a protein a lipid a fat sorry and dairy to kind of balance it out so that we can get it back to remineralization. So when we categorize food, we'll say that, oh, this food is karyogenic, or this food is acidic, or this food is karyostatic. Karyogenic means that this food causes cavities, can cause cavity. So all these food here, all the carbs, all the sugar from the ice cream, that, that can, a cake, right? That can cause cavi cavities. Acidic is like lemonade, soda, those are acidic. It weakens the pH. Even like if you think of Diet Coke, okay, Diet Coke, yeah, it doesn't have sugar, but Diet Coke is acidic. And anything acidic weakens the enamel. And if it weakens the enamel, there's a chance that you can get cavities. Karyostatic, these are foods that are good for the teeth, that don't, in, you know, increase the chance of you getting cavities. So it, look, if you look at here, uh, dairy, protein, right, meat, those are, are hard vegetables. Um, those are good because they stimulate salivary flow, right? Um, so milk is good. Cheese is good because um, cheese cancels out any pH. And so we want people to eat more karyostatic food or if they're eating karyogenic food to pair it with a karyostatic food item so that it cancels out the acid attack. So karyogenic are these food over here. These are some examples of carbs, basically. And we, what we say is fermentable carbs. So fermentable carbs, they kind of break down into sugar. And they're like cookies, donuts, cake, candy. A banana is actually also considered karyogenic because they're sticky and retentive. Um, raisins, right? Like any starchy foods like potatoes, uh, rice, pasta, pretzels, bread, corn. Um, yeah, those are sticky food. And they can, um, they're bad for you because they can cause the teeth to get weakened or the enamel to get weak. Here are some examples of ultra processed foods. So all of them are kind of packaged, right? They're put into a package and usually anything that's processed, anything that goes to a factory to get made is uh, not good because it can stick to your teeth. Karyostatic foods, so these are food that static means stop. So it stops caries, stops cavities. They um, prevent cavities. So they try to make the pH more neutral, more seven. So protein fats and anything calcium rich, right? So like uh, cheese, milk, those are really good for you. So here are some examples of cheese. Cheese is excellent. We would highly, highly recommend uh, individuals pairing food with cheese because it cancels out the acid attack. And so here are some more examples. So if you notice, if you notice over here, nuts are good because they're hard. Anything hard brings out more saliva in your mouth. Um, gum, 
that is sugar free or gum that has xylitol, which is um, xylitol is really good for you. We'll talk about that. It's good for the teeth. These are also good because when you chew, you stimulate sal saliva, right? Salivary flow increases. And when you have more saliva in your mouth, it can wash away the acid attack and wash away the food that's in your mouth. So here we see the good foods or gum that are sugar, that's sugar free, milk, proteins, right? Meat, nuts. These are all good um, karyostatic foods. And we talked about acid foods where if you have soda, if you have citrus fruits like lemon, if you have yogurt or orange, um, if you have yogurt and grapes, they are acidic. So they do lower the pH. So uh, we need to be careful Like when we eat this, make sure we drink water right away. Make sure we pair it with the, with the protein or a calcium rich um, type of food like cheese and milk. Okay, um, this is an example of oops, uh, damage from sipping acidic soda. So this person is drinking acidic soda, and what's happening is the enamel is getting weak and weak, and it's chipping away at the enamel. If you look at this too, do you see how it's so thin and transparent on the incisal edge? You see that? That is because they're, the, fr the frequency plays a role here. They're sipping soda a lot throughout the day, or they're drinking soda every day, and it's weakening the enamel, and it's thinning out the enamel. So it's not, a, it's not a good thing. So anything starchy is sticky, is retentive, can cause ca cavities. So um, starch food kind of, when it breaks down, it becomes sugar. Anything that ends in OSE is sugar, like glucose, fructose, maltose, they're all sugary um, types. And so because they stick to the mouth, they're retentive, such as bread, rice, any vending machine, snacks, they, um, they're not good for you. And what's worse, even worse than just sugar alone is if you have a bread, which is starch, right, which is retentive, and you pair it with jelly, with jam, which is, again, sugary and retentive. You pair that together, that is more detrimental than just a simple sugar. So we really need to watch out what we're eating, because if we are eating that, make sure we have something um, kind of static that we can pair it with. So a glass of milk, for example, would be good, because they... Otherwise, they would just get stuck in between your teeth. Um, here's an example of cheese puffs stuck in between your teeth. And if you don't have water, if you don't pair it with something, it will stay there and do more damage than good. The sequence also matters. So if you're eating something karyogenic like bread, bite and eat something karyostatic right after. Uh, like chew on a high, uh, like, um, uh, carrot, for example, a hard carrot will kind of buffer it or balance it out. Eat, eat crunchy food. So when you're eating something like carbs, make sure you have a crunchy food, um, like, like nuts, for example, uh, carrots that are hard, for example, so that you can have enough saliva to wash off that karyogenic food. So acidogenic means that um, acid attacks happening. Aciduric is that uh, the the ability to tolerate and thrive in an acidic environment. So if your mouth is aciduric, that means it loves to, you know, be in that acidic environment. The acid that I want you to know is lactic. So lactic acid is found when you have an acid attack, and uh, it is the most common type of acid, the lactic acid. It's the most common type of acid that happens during a cavity attack or during an acid attack. Now there's bacteria in our mouth. And when you have bacteria and you pair it with the food, you get this acid attack. So what are the bacteria that we need to know that cause cavities? The ones that I really, really want you to know is Streptococcus mutans, Actinomyces, and Lactobacillus. Okay, those are the three cavities that, um, or sorry, bacteria that really play a huge role in forming cavities. They all do, to be honest, but these are the ones that are most important. The way your teeth are structured matters. If you have deep bits in fissure, remember um, what can happen is food can get stuck in there and our bristles aren't big enough to kind of get in those areas. So what do you think is the best way to seal this off? You said sealants should be correct. So anytime you see clients that have deep pits and fissures, we want to seal it off with a sealant so that it, the food doesn't go deep. If you don't have straight teeth, it's very hard to clean in that area. It's very hard to brush. And so we're more susceptible when we have teeth that are malaligned. We know that fluoride is so important. We always 
tell our clients, please, you know, use fluoride toothpaste every day because it really uh, decreases the chance of you getting cavities. We will also um, recommend or do uh, perform fluoride varnish for those individuals that are at a high risk of cavities. So we would do a caries risk assessment, um, which I'll talk about at the end. And when we do the caries risk, ass risk assessment, it'll tell us whether they need fluoride or not. And so if they're high risk or even moderate risk, we're going to recommend fluoride. So this is a fluoride varnish application, which is an excellent source of fluoride that we can apply as, as often as needed. So every three months, if they're coming every three months to you, make sure you apply fluoride every three months. Here's what's interesting. When you have fluoride, so when you brush with fluoride, what happens is that even though you spit out the toothpaste, the saliva absorbs fluoride. And then the fluoride kind of goes, it stays in your mouth for three hours. So even though you spit it out, it does stay in your mouth for three hours. So that's a good thing because it's trying to help the enamel become stronger. And so we need saliva in our mouth. Saliva, it has, even though it's 99% water, 1% of um, saliva has calcium, has phosphate, has proteins, and they're really good for the teeth. Um, so we really want a lot of saliva. Because fluoride is a number one protective factor, then saliva is number two. So after fluoride, saliva is number one. And saliva clears all the food, and any acid attack, it'll try to kill the, it'll try to dilute the acid attack. And then time we eat something crunchy, or even if we chew on gum, it increases saliva production. So that's really good. Chewing gum is helpful. But if you don't, if this is a mouth that doesn't have a lot of saliva, you can see that they're getting demineralization. Look at all the white spots. The white spots are demineralization. And so um, this can happen. So we like vicious, um, actually we like fluid saliva, like the saliva that just flu flows nicely in our mouth. The thick saliva isn't as effective. Vicious means thick. Thick saliva isn't as effective as, as rinsing teeth. The, we like this, this flowy saliva. And so if you have lots of saliva, that's actually a really good thing because the fluid will call clear out faster, so pH can return to 6.8 to 7, which is what we want. So I was, as I was saying earlier, saliva has lots of great stuff like phosphate, sodium bicarbonate, protein, and urea. And those are great because any acid that you have, if you have an acid attack, the saliva will try really hard to bring it back, the pH back to neutral. So saliva has calcium and phosphate, uh, phosphorus too, which is amazing with remineralization. It makes the teeth harder and stronger. And then, of course, Hygiene plays a huge role, right? If we can do a great job brushing and flossing, we will do, um, we will keep our teeth caries free. Now, unfortunately, sometimes what can happen is early childhood caries where um, kids can have cavities in the maxillary anterior teeth. And this is probably because they're drinking water, they're, sorry, not water, they're drinking from a bottle, like milk or juice, for example, and it really causes, and it just sits there because they're drinking from the water, or nursing, for example, um, so breastfeeding and the food, the milk just sits there. What can happen is it can cause cavities and that cavity is that's like rampant cavity, that really bad cavity called early childhood caries, ECC. And you'll notice that it mostly affects the maxillary anterior teeth. So this is before, this is after. And the reason why this happens is because, um, it, the, the milk or the juice is just pooling there. So how can we prevent it? Well, we wean on them, the kids off the bottle. And if you need a bottle, water is the drink of choice, not milk, not juice, nothing else. Here's another example. Look at that. The poor child, all their enamel has gone such, you know, terrible, severe early childhood caries. And so this is why we really need to educate the parents on why bottle feeding isn't good um, and why we shouldn't, um, so it says here, we should wean them off the ball at an early age because we do not want this to happen. So many people are being mindful these days of not having sugars, especially those that have diabetes, they know that they can't have sugar, so they'll supplement it. They'll supplement uh, sugar with a sweetener, like a Splenda. So let's look at this. So there are so many different types. Like Splenda, for example, is a... Um, is a common one and you may have heard of all of these ones so they have like sweeteners and these are the names of the sweeteners that are listed here and so um those are okay 
When I say okay, what I mean is they are non-cariogenic. They do not cause cavities. So sugar causes cavity, but using a sweetener that um, is not sugar does not cause cavity. If you look at the um, Splenda, it's made from sucralose, but sucralose is not sucrose. Um, it actually changes the ingredient, the chemical composition changes, and it, um, it it doesn't become sugar, so it doesn't damage the teeth. There's also sugar alcohol, and the one that I want to point out to is xylitol. Xylitol it comes from birch wood, and uh, what's good about xylitol? There's lots of research done on xylitol, and what's it, so it actually comes from um, corn cobs or birch wood. And what it does, it actually reduces bacteria in the saliva. So it's actually really good. So xylitol is really good because it reduces um, bacteria in the saliva. And so there's so many gums and candies that are out there that have xylitol and they control the uh, dental caries. So they actually reduce the chance of you getting cavities. Sorbitol is made from um, corn syrup, but it can also be found naturally in prunes, apples, peaches, and pears. Um, so chewing gum, with sorbitol is also good because it has lots of anti-caries properties. It also reduces the chance of you getting cavities. So sugar alcohols are also good, just like sweeteners, because they are non-caryogenic. But xylitol is the one that is really, really good. Um, we highly recommend, dental professionals highly recommend xylitol as an excellent sugar substitute. And there's lots of, we also recommend gums. Like I think the XL gums also have xylitol. So to sum everything up, this is what's really important. Be aware of frequency. We shouldn't be eating all the time. And if we are, um, what's happening is our pH is dipping. It's, our pH is, keeps going lower and lower and can't come back up to um, our neutral pH, which is 6.8 to 7. So if we're eating too often, it could be a problem. It could cause more cavities. And carbohydrates, if it's retentive, if it's fermentable carbohydrates, um, they stick to our teeth and they can really cause cavities. We need to be mindful of that. So if we have lots of saliva and if we eat a lot of crunchy foods like hard carrots, um, nuts, it really brings out more saliva in our mouth, which is good because it can wash away everything. We need to have toothpaste with fluoride because we know fluoride remineralizes, strengthens the enamel. And make sure we have lots of karyostatic food, like meat, milk, cheese, nuts. Those are all good for us in terms of teeth because they um, bring the pH back to neutral, back to seven. And pay attention to sequencing. So pair our food. So if we're eating um, carbs like bread or crackers, for example, pair it with a fat. Pair it with cheese. Pair it with milk. Pair it with meat um, or beans or some, a protein, for example, so that it cancels out the attack. So here's a tip. If when you eat a meal, try to include one crunchy food with it because that crunchy food will push out, um, will stimulate saliva, right? And then it'll help clear out or wash out all the food from our, our mouth. And this, I'm going to end up with the Canberra, which is a caries management um, by risk assessment. And what this shows is that this is actually one example. There's so many different examples, but th these are all things that your client could have. And let's say when you ask your client um, if they don't go to a dentist regularly, so you check off this. If they have poor oral hygiene, you check off this. If they have lots of like malaligned teeth or um, deep grooves or crowding, you check off this. So you would check off the boxes of what they have. If they have like recession and their roots are exposed, you check off this. If they have restorations, then you check this off. If they only have one to two check boxes, boxes, then they're at low risk. If they have three to six check boxes, they're moderate. If they have seven to ten, they're high. Um, another way to do this is to assess for caries is is um, what you want to do is you want to see this is like really bad. So if they have any white spots, if they had restoration recently, when I say recently within the past three years, um, you know, if they have any cavities, they're at a high risk for cavities. Okay, so this is important because I'm going to show you one more slide. Anyone that has moderate or high risk, um, what you'll notice is they probably had a cavity within the last three years. So if they had a cavity within the last three years, they are moderate. Um, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase that. If they had a cavity within the last three years, they are automatically high risk. Okay, so if they had a cavity within the last three years, they are high risk. But if they did not have a cavity within the last three years, and they only had one or two risk factors, 
when I say wrist fractures, there's only one or two, so one to two blocks here, and they didn't have any cavities. Um, and in the, again, there's so many different cameras that are out there, then they're at moderate risk. And then if they have um, no cavities when, in the, within the last three years, and they don't really have that many risk factors, maybe just one to two risk factors, then they would be low risk. So I think what I would do for moderate is if they have anywhere from three to six check boxes, so if they have three to six check boxes here, and they had no cavity within the last three years, they're considered moderate. If they have no cavity at all within the last three years, and they only had one to two boxes you checked up here, they are low risk. And high risk is they had seven to 10 boxes checked off, or they had cavities within the last three years. Anyone that has cavities within the last three years is automatically placed at a high risk. And then what you do, the treatment that you offer, it varies. So low risk, just tell them to use a fluoride, continue to use a fluoride toothpaste. If they need sealants, give them sealants. And then just do um, in-office fluoride if indicated. So let's say you did a polish. Polish means that you, what you did when you polish is you remove a very, very tiny amount, very tiny micromillimeter of enamel. So you got to resupplement, bring that enamel back by applying fluoride. But if they are low risk, I wouldn't apply fluoride. Unless you do polish, then you can, then you have to apply fluoride. But if they're moderate or high, you would do fluoride application. You would also do, if they're moderate, you would also do get them to do a 24-hour diary so you can assess how often they're eating, if they're eating carbs, if they're pairing it with anything. Um, that would be a good educational component that you can offer to those individuals that have moderate risk. And you would give them um, fluoride uh, mouthwash over the counter or fluoride supplements, especially if they live in an unfluoridated area. If they are at high risk, you would probably do a three-day diet diary. Um, you would probably apply fluoride varnish. And you would definitely, with all of them, you would always educate them on proper oral hygiene techniques. Okay, that wraps up our um, chapter on diet and dental caries. Thanks, everyone.